Okay, so what I wanted to talk about today was uh, sharing some tips, some experiences on how we did our VC round. Now, how many of you have done a, a significant funding round or have been involved in that already? Is more important than your marriage because you can get out of a marriage without too much hassle. With a VC deal, you're, you're, you're done for life, basically. It's really difficult to get out of this agreement. So how to survive? And I've, I've made this really as practical as I can and some really real world, um, real world stuff. Again, this is, this is just our first experience, um, but it was such a big learning experience. We've changed so much, learned so much. It's a very steep learning curve. Um, but I think what would have helped if we would have understood how VCs think and how they work and how they, you know, they don't just cut you a check for 20 million. We picked up 20 million last year uh, in our A round. That's a pretty sizable check, to be honest. Um, and they don't just give it to you. That might seem the way in the first couple of meetings, but uh, understanding how that business works, how they compete with each other as well, what they're trying to do, what their metrics are, which is basically the return on their, the yearly return on their uh, investment, um, is, is really important. Be really considerate of their, uh, of their time because you might feel like a, like a hot shot. Hopefully you are hot shit and you get all these VCs calling you. Keep in mind, um, their time is really valuable. Uh, so I've been in meetings that took like 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Just get, you know, be to the point because these guys don't wait around. Um, write shit down. You see, I had that. <laughs> I'm glad I did. Uh, and I wish I did that more because it's really important to note down what exactly you said because they'll be writing it down as well. So if you say, well, we're gonna grow 10X next year, they're gonna write that down and they're gonna say, well, you told me 10X last time you, you saw me. So especially when you have a lot of these meetings, make sure you write your experiences down. Make sure you, get, you, um, you remember what the difficult questions were because these guys, you'll do a couple of these meetings, they're the smartest guys I've ever met, really. Uh, so it's, it's such a good learning experience as well. Um, figure out the questions they're asking and they'll all s start asking the same questions um, and it's good to write that down. Also keep in mind, it's a really small world. These, these guys know each other really well. Often they'll, they'll, they'll leave a, a fund to start their own fund or they'll, you know, they'll be working at a couple of funds, uh, funds and they all know each other and they work together as well. So keep that in mind. Um, another thing to keep in mind that uh, don't assume just because you're talking to an associate um, that that isn't important. That associate, that person doing the first call reaching out to you, it might feel like cold calling. It is kind of cold calling because they reach out to thousands of companies. Um, that is your champion. Do not be rude, do not dismiss it, do not like that is an equally important meeting uh, as with the founder. If you dismiss this guy, he's not gonna champion you to his boss. That's the way it works. This guy has to be really positive about you, really sure before he considers it bringing as, as an opportunity to, um, to their board. Um, another thing we learned is, and this is sort of when, I f when we first started talking about rounds, we thought we figured like, okay, we need about eight million. Let's call it 10 just to be safe. Um, then we went with 20. By the time we did the round, we went with 20. That was within a couple of months. And that felt like too much. Um, but by the time we had that money, by the time you're, you're, if you're scaling at, at, at a quick, at, if you're scaling quickly, you're going to need a lot more money than you're comfortable with when you start that round. So I'd always go 2x what you budgeted for. Shit costs money. Um, Another thing to watch out for is what will happen a lot, and that's the good thing of having a big VC on board, they'll do a lot of fishing for you. You wanna find out what your competitor is doing, you wanna find out who's on the market, who's selling, they'll find out for you. But you can also be on the other end. So watch out that you don't just send out your deck, send out your whole strategy, uh, customer names and that kind of stuff. Just assume that's gonna land in the lap of your uh, competitors. So just keep in mind it's it's, uh, it happens, and it'll work in your advantage once you get the round. Okay, so the meeting itself, um, again, I've, I've only done it my way sort of thing. I've always been 
really honest, very direct, very to the point because you don't want to waste people's time. It's okay not to know stuff. This is, has been such a learning experience to talk with these VCs. We did a whole sort of round and every meeting we're, we're getting better. We're, we're saying, oh, this is why you're asking this because you want to know the market fit. This is why you're asking this. You want to know uh, what the potential market size is and, and they'll ask about, okay, so what percentage are your enterprise customers versus your growing SP on, on, on smaller deals? Um, nobody's perfect yet. So actually, I think it's an opportunity to say, I don't know. This is, this is why I'm asking you. These guys have the experience. You don't have to know everything. They want a company that they can improve easily on. So if they see that you're doing something wrong, that's an easy fix. In our case, um, sales was was underdeveloped because we just well, that's why we're working with Yako. Uh, in the U.S., they're they're sort of ahead of their game. That's an easy fix for a VC if they see a great product, great team, great everything, and all that's not working is the sales department. That's an easy fix. So. It's good to be honest, nobody's perfect. They're not looking for perfection. They're looking for something they can quickly just push money in to improve. Um, also, the, the, the potential of your idea. That, they're not looking to invest to the current company. They're looking in, is this a company that we can just put money in and it will grow? Or, which was sort of the case with us, we didn't quite realize that, 20 million might seem like a lot of money. For these guys, it's, we were on the, the lower end of the, of the scale. And it only makes sense for these guys, for the big VCs, if they sort of have a good projection of putting 10 million in and then a B round, maybe 50, and then maybe go IPO or a C round. These guys need to get rid of their money. So, um, no, it's, it's serious. It's that, they have like billions they need to spend. And if they don't spend it, it's not making money. So they'll rather wait until you're worth a lot more just because they can invest more and if the risk uh, is lower. So they wanna see execution potentially. They wanna see, can you guys get there without too much of our help? Or do you need to learn everything yourself? And with us, that was, I didn't realize that was a, a perceived as a drawback. Like, we don't know shit. We're first timers, and we were like, "Well, yeah, we bootstrapped the company. Very cool. And, you know, we're uh, we're still learning. That's a word you should avoid. But they won't want to pay for you learning. Um, they want to know how much support you're going to need to take it to the next level. Um, another thing we've learned, uh, and in in general, it's really difficult to do big changes, big structural changes like that. Founder, you sort of not sure about, or the Get the founding team straight aligned. Make sure the stock is right. Any changes in the cap table, any C-level changes, any changes you think you might want to make, make them before you go into that round. Um, because it's going to be really difficult to make those kind of decisions because you need a board meeting, you need approval, and, and it's, it just gets really sticky. Because let's say you're, you're, you want to do a change, you want to spend money. Um, and your number's a little bit off, it's just gonna be a difficult, you're, you're sort of afraid to call your VC like, Dad, can I have some money for whatever? Um, so make sure any big changes, now you can get away with it, now you don't have to, have, you don't have any interference. So get all these big changes done. Uh, also, uh, I've had that as well, um, buy, like we bought the domain name, for example, Bino.com, we bought that right before we did the round because the second you do a round, that price is gonna go up. So think ahead of stuff you can do now that you really should get rid of, get that done before you do the deal. Um, another thing we've learned is, again, these guys, they talk a lot. It's a long-term game, it's a long-term relationship. The sooner you talk with these guys, um, the better. You, you, you have to build a relationship. Uh, it, it just really helps in the future because you never know how the cookie crumbles. You might be really close to a deal it's always good to, to keep those VC relationships really warm. And I did a, I emailed, I contacted all the VCs we, con we had a good relationship with. I reached out personally to them. Despite we did a deal with, with, with Insight, I reached out to them saying, listen, I'm sorry it didn't work, but you know, this is what you can, this is what I, my perception was. Maybe you know, it's helpful. If you guys, if you can give them feedback, it's really helpful. Again, you never know how the cookie crumbles. Um, 
I'll come to that in the next slide. Actually, I'll do that now. Um, so this is from the term sheet to the deal. Um, let's see. I feel like in the next slide. But what we've learned is that it's nego negotiating what what matters really, and counterintuitive is not the valuation. Everybody's seen Silicon Valley, right? Hands up who's seen Silicon Valley. Okay, everybody should watch that show because it's the perfect example. The guy takes on this huge round and basically kills himself by doing so because then they get a down round, dilution. Um, you're an A round, and this I had to learn this the hard way because intuitively you'll be like, yeah, I'm just gonna go with the biggest valuation um, because it's money, right? It's kind of money, but what really matters if you have to see that investment, especially if it's that big, it's just a first step. Nobody is making any money in this round. Nobody. It's, it's not real money yet. Any money is in a secondary or in a B round or an IPO or in your exit. Nobody's going to make money in this A round. Um, so it really is a stepping stone to your next round. That's when it really starts mattering, if you can take money off the table. Until then, the only reason you're doing this is, is this the best, quickest way to get to that next stage? It's not about the valuation. That's, that might just kill you in the end. Like, you don't want too high a valuation because then you have to meet those expectations. And if you don't and you're burning money, um, well, look up what a down round is and, um, and watch Silicon Valley. Uh, the other thing is, so, so negotiate on what does matter. Those are, go, go with a partner that you're basically married with. Again, this is a very long-term relationship. It's not about, negotiating out the best deal, at least not in our case. Maybe for real pros, they'll be able to do that. They'll be able to shop around as just about the money. For us, it's more about the ambition of, a, of, a, of an A player partner. We're buying ambition. We're buying pedigree as well. So it, it, apparently, and by chance, it was the best deal for us, but it's also you're, you're, you're partnering up with a very important uh, uh, partner and you're, you're it's a very important stage, and that's where the, the real money is made. Not now, but in the future. Especially in SaaS, it's all forward revenue. Um, so what does matter is the, the, you have to have a good feeling that this is the best partner for you. It's not necessarily the nicest people. Um, <laughs> Insight is a, is a New York firm, and they're the biggest firm out there. They're not your friends. They're not, I mean, they're, they're nice, but that's not the reason we're doing business with them. You don't want, if you want to win the Olympic Games, you don't want the nicest coach, you want the toughest one that will push you to extremes. That's how you win a gold, gold medal. They're not your pals. Um, another thing to really, that, that was sort of a learning experience for us, um, was the reps and warranties. You think you're negotiating on the, on deal size or in percentages, the real negotiation is the reps and warranties. Now, I spent a lot of time actually diving into that legal uh, material, and it helps, like with any services you, um, you buy, like an accountant or a lawyer, the success of that person really depends on, am I still good sound-wise, or is it kind of iffy? Um, the success really depends on how good you are managing that person. You need to know what they're doing. You need to give them uh, clear guidance, what you want. Um, and some of these reps and warranties are kind of edge cases that you don't really have to think about, but some of them are really, you, you have to understand what these guys are negotiating about. And I've invested quite a bit of time, actually nights as well, going through these calls with lawyers and it costs a lot of money. We're, we were spending like close to a million on this deal. So you want to be in on that call where that money is going because otherwise they're just going to burn through all that, um, all those hours. So again, lawyer up, that's another thing. That was so expensive, that deal. We spent so much on lawyers and I'm a Dutch guy. Well, I'm sort of a Dutch guy. Uh, it was echt heel duur. And we weren't really used to spend that kind of money, but it was really, we went with the best we could afford or we could find. Um, and that person will pay for itself tenfold in a deal. You need that comfort of this guy's watching out for you and you need big guns because 
uh, trust me, in the U.S., they'll bring out the big guns. And those will rip you apart. Um, so you need a, somebody tough in your corner, and it costs money, but it's it's well well spent, and it's it's an uncomfortable amount of money. Um, so, but spend it; it's it's worth it. Uh, another thing, again, with the legal stuff, voice your concerns. Don't worry. At least that's what I always did. I'm like, don't worry about sounding like an idiot. Usually, you're right. If you feel like, well, is that fair? Is that is that sort? Of, you're usually your gut feeling is right, or at least mine was, and. It's that's what you're paying these guys for. If you have a good lawyer, they will explain it to you so you understand. If you don't understand, it's their fault. It's not your fault. So um, just make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into because the most of the time is spent on those reps and warranties. It's boring. It's difficult. It's it seems like an edge case. But what's the song? And I want prenup. We want prenup. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Um, this is another thing that uh, I have a, a mentor, Arco von Newland. He's the uh, founder of Exact uh, Software, and he he warned me beforehand, like you know, like you get told by your dad sometimes, like, well, you know, watch out, this is gonna happen, and you're like, yeah, dad, whatever, I know what I'm doing. Um, he told me like, any second before, if, until that money is in the bank that deal can go sour. It could be just a couple of minutes before the deal actually closes, it can still go sour. And we actually walked away like in the middle of the night before the deal, we were on the verge of, of not doing it. Like it's that tight. It's never in the bank until it's in the bank. So keep that in mind. That's also the reason don't burn bridges with other VCs before you actually have that money in the bank because those last minute negotiations that will tire you down, you're working days, nights, night calls with West Coast and stuff. It's just, it kills you. And then you're like, oh, should I just give in? But you can't really, it's, it's that, at that difficult part when the negotiation gets tough, they go tough as well. They're super nice in the beginning because they have to sell as well, right? That's their business model. They have to sell their product. Um, and they're, they're competing with other VCs. That sort of turns around just before the deal closes. You're like, oh, fuck. Uh, <laughs> it can get pretty hairy. Um, so just just keep that in mind that it, that the relationship sort of shifts, and it might seem fun and nice, but after you t sign that term sheet, that's when they might slow the deal down a little bit, and you're like, why why is this taking so long? Because they're just waiting for more numbers, probably. So they'll say we'll commit to yeah we'll get the deal done in June. <laughs> they won't get the deal done in June. They're gonna wait. So they'll time is on their side. And as soon as they have that term sheet signed, and I'm not saying everyone is like that, it's not a bad thing, and is, but just be aware that there's more at play, at least that's what we've noticed. It can get, yeah, it can get pretty, um, you can get pretty paranoid about what's going on because these deals take more time than you probably expect, at least it did with us. Um, so if you're anything like, like us, bootstrapped, because that was the title of the, of, of the talk as well, you think, Tell me who recognizes it. Like your number one, two, three, four, and five problem is money, right? Cash flow. It's always about cash flow. Remove that problem. Let's say that's not a problem anymore. This is when it really starts. This is when you get 10 new problems and you wish, fuck, I wish I'd only had to worry about money. At least that's just a number. At least that's something I understand. At least that's something I can hustle to fix. I can go to the bank. I can go to my, my I can ask for delay on payments or I can get people to pay it sooner. That's all pretty easy. But now that that isn't an a part of the equation anymore, um, there's new challenges. And one I kind of hate and enjoy at the same time is the sort of the, the, the exercise. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good one. Like, okay, so this is your plan, 100% growth. What happens if we add 10 million to the mix? Um, can you grow twice as fast? Which is like, that will triple your value. But that's sort of the kind of challenge you're gonna get when money is out of the question, no excuses left, right? Why can't you grow now? So um, the, more you, the more money you make, keep in mind that a VC, a VC business, and maybe, maybe I'm expecting some questions or some feedback on this. But at the end of the day, if you don't do anything with that money, 
that's not good. They want to see you put that money to work because that's where some of the risk isn't aligned. Um, in general, VCs are, are, are great, right? They, they, make, they make this happen. So, and it's been an amazing learning experience. But it's also good to understand where you're not aligned. Where, where, where do they think different? Where, what's their agenda? And one of those things is if they want you to burn through that money because there's no risk for them. If you run out of money, you're the person that's fucked. You'll get it. It's, it's, it they want to spend more money. So they'll encourage you actually to keep increasing the burn not unhealthily so, but it's it's for them. It's not a risk. It's not a bad thing if you burn through the through the money, because they're just going to get more equity, and they're fine in risking. Why don't you just risk ten million to see if you can double your growth? Yeah, if it goes well, everybody's happy. If it goes wrong, they'll just add more money and get a lot more equity. So keep in mind that 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 you're not always aligned with your VC, um, and that money does come at a at a pretty high price. It's not free money. It's not money you can just spend. Um, and there's pretty high expectations, which is also the cool part, right? This, is, this has helped us propel us, learn, uh, but it's a steep learning curve and there are high expectations of that. Um, in that same light, uh, M&A is, is, is important. If, if, if you look at it from a VC perspective, they don't have to de-risk. They, I mean, they're, they're basically, they look at it in a spreadsheet. If you can double your revenue, this is actually, this happened to us. We were in, uh, in the day this deal signed, the day we si finally signed this motherfucker. Uh, I lost two nights of sleep and we were all like, oh. Jeff Horing, which is the, the founder of, uh, of, he calls me, he said, hey Chris. Like, and, and I thought he was gonna cr congratulate me or something on the deal, but he didn't, he was like, yeah. Uh, can you fly out to, uh, to the US? I think we have an opportunity for, um, uh, for M&A. And it was a lucky opportunity, but that is the way these guys think. They can add companies. We were able, because we were growing so much quicker, we were able to take, uh, to, to acquire a competitor um, or another vendor um, that was a lot bigger, but just wasn't growing that quickly. Um, and that was day one of our deal. Like, yeah, okay, fly over. We'll leverage the 20 million, so they'll borrow you more money. <laughs> if I'm like, okay, I finally got the money. And then they ask you to basically triple your debt. So borrow 60 million and, and then uh, almost triple your revenue. If we tripled our revenue, that would be huge. But obviously there's a big risk because we have to keep up that revenue growth. And if it fails, as a founder, you're fucked. Um, so we did look into that deal. It's, that was a lot of work. Um, and we, at the day we were gonna close that deal, in fact, we walked away from it, um, which was really tough. And the reason we walked away from it because it was just, it was a little bit too risky. There was too much, we just signed the deal and for a pro management team or for a pro CEO, I'm not a CEO, I've never done this. Um, that's a little bit too risky. So we decided to walk away. That was part of the reason, but it was just, it was sort of untangling. There was a lot of bullshit numbers and it was rushed and it was, it was just really difficult, so we decided to walk away, but that hurt. Not only the cost of getting to that point was high, um, but it also hurt the relationship with the VC. Just expect these guys to be out on the, on the, on the lookout for you to acquire companies. It's a quicker way to grow. It's just adding companies on a spreadsheet, which is super easy to do on a spreadsheet, and it's what these guys do because they can just fund it, they get an even higher uh, return, they leverage Silicon Valley Bank, they leverage the bank money, um, so it's easier for them, but it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's like a, having a noose uh, around your neck. But just keep in mind that that is expected. You can't just walk away from those M&A deals and say, oh, no, I'm not gonna do M&A. The, the fuck you are gonna do M&A, that's why we gave you the money. Um, so just keep that in mind that M&A is a really important aspect of, of how VCs think. It's easy. Um, Having said that, the whole business, I mean, there's so much money in the market and um, there's so much, so many of these VCs are competing for hot startups. So they also need you to, to perform. So that their interests are also your company's interest, but just not always the founder's interest. Okay, I'm almost at, um, at the end of what I wanted to say. 
in case you're still interested in uh, doing business with a VC, don't freak out about this. This is, uh, like I said at the beginning, it's such a good experience. Just talking to these guys, understanding what metrics are important to them, uh, getting great feedback about your product, about, about your team. It is a really good, uh, it helped us mature as a company. It helped us understand the metrics we should be measuring. It helped us understand where their strengths are. It helped us understand how we're perceived by these guys that can compare us metrics wise with hundreds of their portfolio companies. So it's a huge learning experience. It's a fun experience. It's, at least I've experienced it's a lot of fun. Um, and again, these guys are gonna be the, some of the smartest people you've, uh, you've ever met. Um, and it's a, a humbling and learning experience. It's a wild ride. And if you ask me, would I do it again? Let's say it doesn't go well. I think I'd still do it again. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And if you're in SaaS, you can't just leave that on the table. You can't, you'll be kicking yourself the rest of your life if you don't go for it, if you don't gun it, where the fuck are you doing SaaS? It doesn't make sense. Um, it's risky, but it's, it's a hell of a ride. And I think you should um, consider if you're in, in SaaS, that's the way to go. Um, hopefully some of these points have sort of helped you not make huge mistakes, but it's, it's a risky ride, and, um, uh, but very well worth it. So take that risk. All right, so we have time, right? We have a couple minutes. Um, why do you pick the VCs that invested in Binder? Uh, actually, I had this discussion with Jeff uh, last week, and, it, and it's pretty simple. Um, again, we talked to the top tier VCs, all of them, and they're all, they all have this, well, they all can afford the same. They all have deep pockets. They'll be able to support you during the rounds. Um, at the end of the day, most of it is just, it's still just a check. There's, don't, I, I don't think you should hope for too much support um, from, uh, especially at this size, they can't spend that much time on you. Uh, maybe with smaller VCs, that's, that's very different, but that's not the reason you should go with a VC. The reason I did it was, um, I liked the style of, of, of this New York firm. They were the quickest, they were the most aggressive. They had a portfolio that they can prove they can take take us to really owning the category and expanding the category and go all the way to IPO if we want to. So for us, it was more, we chose based on ambition. Um, and these guys were just the quickest. He flew over right here to Amsterdam and we closed it. We, so we sort of agreed on a deal right there. I like that style. I like that, that East Coast style. And we talked to a lot of Boston VCs, uh, Silicon Valley VCs. They're slightly different styles and um, I guess as a Dutchman, I really like the New York style. It's to the point, it's aggressive, it's tough, but it's, these guys are, are well, I consider them the best. So that's, that was the reason why we went for, uh, for Insight. Um, bootstrapped or large A round? Oh yeah, actually was a, that was a, that's a really good question because that was one of the points I wanted to make. If you're considering doing funding, um, if you can wait, wait. Uh, ultimately, you're gonna be sticking onto a lot more equity if you can prolong that, that first round. Um, the more stable you are, the more predictable you are, the higher the revenue, the higher the multiplier, um, there's just more security around a, a larger company. So the larger stage you can sell at, you're gonna make a lot more money. Um, but there's a certain point that you can't just grow that quickly as a bootstrap company, so best to trade off a share a little bit of your company to allow that that what's left to grow even quicker. That's sort of the trade-off. Um, but the longer you can wait, the better, I guess. It's, it means more, more money in your pocket. Uh, if you could start binary on what would you do differently? Uh, I get the domain name right. <laughs> For starters, that costs us money. Uh, that's a loaded question. It's, it's a good question, but it's also, I, it's easy with hindsight. All of this is, is super easy with hindsight, but it's, I don't think it's about um, experience so much because nobody really knows what they're doing. Um, it's more about can you learn quick enough? I mean, are you, 
learning from that experience so you so you can sort of adopt and change quick enough. Um, I didn't really make, well, of course I made a ton of mistakes, but you need to make those mistakes to move forward. It's not like I regret anything. Um, so what would I do different? I do it a lot quicker now and I, I, I do it, a, of course I do it differently than bootstrapped, uh, but I couldn't have done it any differently back then. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's a difficult question. How much influence do the VCs have in your day-to-day -day business? Um, not that much, to be honest, as, as um, they're really helpful. And I don't want to make this whole thing seem like VCs are bad. Um, they're not. They're not. They're, they're, they're good people to work with uh, as long as you're clear on your numbers and, and you don't sort of lie to them. I don't think you should never lie to your, to your banker, to your VC, to your insurance. Don't lie. Um, Yeah, so I think, uh, what was, what was the, the question's gone. <laughs> I lost my train of thought here. Whatever. Uh, we'll move on to the next, sorry. What would I do differently? How much? Let's start dying again. Yeah, so I wouldn't really do anything differently. How much of 20 million have you spent? Wouldn't you like to know? Um, quite a bit. Quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but our, uh, uh, again, that's what the money's for. If you're not willing to spend the money, then don't take the money. Um, so we're, we are burning through the money, but at a comfortable rate. We're not burning crazy, uh, crazy amounts. So we, we still have enough um, left in the bank. Is it a bromance or father-son relationship with a VC? It's really good, really. Uh, I actually use that word, bromance. Uh, I'd like to think it's a little bit of a bromance. But I'm just one of six of his sort of uh, protégés, Jeff. Um, I think there's a little bit of both, but at the end of the day, I don't think he, you know, you're not your, they're not your friends. They're just in there to make a buck. So as soon as this goes sour, I think the relationship will change. But all in all, um, really smart people. I have a good, good relationship, good click with, with, um, with Insight. It's always kind of nervous, but if you, you know, if you're honest, if you're quick, if you have your numbers all in your head, I mean, that's an important thing. Do not waste your time. Make sure you have everything in your head. Then, um, then it's a really good relationship. But it's a little bit of both. I like to think it's a bromance, but he probably thinks I'm a kid. Things changed at Binary internally after you got the funding. Um, not, yeah, a lot of things changed. Um, just the, the, the reporting side of things. I mean, we had to become so metric driven because you're reporting on all these metrics on a month by month basis. You have to start measuring them and, and that was a little bit of catch up but we're actually pretty well on track with all the systems we're using, um, upgraded NetSuite and stuff like that. So um, not that much changed but just being a lot more critical and, and I guess the, the toughest part um, of I think this is this is what I was thinking about before I was making this uh, those lists is toughest part about being a CEO I think and I'm I would barely call myself a CEO because uh, I'm more of an entrepreneur I like kicking against things I like you know uh, I I built this company with people I really enjoy being around with I trust being a CEO sort of changes decisions um, one of the toughest realizations that. I had to wrap my mind and heart around was the fact, or is the fact, and you should prepare for this as well, I think. Um, there will be a day that you're the bottleneck. Um, and I was sort of freaked out about that at first, but now I'm sort of getting, that's part of the game. The part of the game is you building a company that eventually outgrows you. And it happens with a lot of people, and it's the toughest part of this whole thing is figuring out when people can't keep up with the growth. So loyalty doesn't mean shit. It's almost like a, a red flag to a VC. Loyalty means, um, let's say we had to rebuild the company right now. Would I hire every single person in the exact same spot if I could just rebuild it from now? No, you wouldn't do that because it's changing. Somebody that leads a, a group of two doesn't lead, can't just grow into a manager that can lead 200 people. So part of being a CEO, I think, especially when you get a VC on board, 
uh, and I've had this, I've made this mistake by saying, well, I, I want to be loyal to people, and they'll be like, um, why are you still learning? We gave you money. You have the ability to hire expertise. Don't learn. I don't want to hear you learning. I want to hear you hiring people that know what they're doing and getting rid of people who don't know what they're doing. That is a, that's a tough position to be in. You have to sort of forget loyalty. If you're, if you're, you know, if you want to be a real CEO, you have to have that mentality. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but it, it, just keep in mind that that's, that's a, a, a big difference. That's, and that's what's changed me when we got that funding it, it toughened you up a little bit. It's it's a tough game, and that realization is there is an end to this. Uh, the chances are, and this is what Jeff told me as well, and he tells me a lot. He's almost never. If you, he says to me, if you're the one, that one CEO that made it from start to end, you'll be an anomaly. It doesn't work like that. And I'm like, well, fuck yeah, I'm an anomaly. <laughs> I can do this. But that's the tough realization. I'm not going to be the CEO of this company when we go, probably, I'm, I'm not saying never and never, but I have to sort of uh, embrace that, that um, this isn't forever. And, and uh, I'm going to be out of my depth sometime, maybe as well. And, and that's a tough, tough one to swallow, but uh, better than just being fired by your board, I guess. How many time was we want to do a few more questions or? Oh, should I? Sorry. Oh, we have a little tidbit for you guys. What do we do with all this money, right? Well, some of you who may have seen on social media or in the news, we just launched a new product. So this is a, a 90 second video that I'll play. And this, whoop. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep talking. And this uh, got Insight really excited. They want to see you pushing the envelope going forward, how can we make this company explode? That's what they're interested in. Not current state, what do we look like next year, what's the track to IPO? And this is our big play on really explosive growth. It's offering a product we're calling Orbit, and it's DIY, and it's freemium. Um, and it's, it's there for basically for everyone. So it's enterprise all the way down to single users. Q video. Oh, <laughs> that's me. I have to. If VR content should be managed in a state of the art way, why would you spend so much time working on it otherwise? Here's something you and your colleagues will appreciate. Welcome to the fastest and most efficient way to professionally manage your creative files for free. Finder Orbit is the first of its kind. So easy to set up, you can use it within minutes. And because Orbit doesn't have any user limit restrictions, you can invite your entire team or even your whole company. Your brand is meant to be used, displayed, and shared endlessly and appropriately. That's why Binder Orbit gives you full control of your marketing distribution with the highest grade of security. Binder Orbit, where creatives get organized, where organizations get creative. <laughs> That's the part. Oh, sorry. Um, so just maybe some background, because this is the stuff you're going to have to prepare with as well. This is all so metric driven. We're tracking every single click. And that's the kind of numbers these VCs want to see. They want to see what's your lead velocity rate, what is the cost per lead, how conversion rates, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's pretty difficult to pull off a very simple product that scales and that you're still making money. So um, if you guys have any questions about that, I'm also happy to answer our freemium uh, experience, but this is day one or day two, so not that much experience yet. Um, do we have any more questions or is that uh, somebody time out? Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>